when people ask me how I got to the great state of Minnesota, because I trained here at Johns Hopkins, I say that one day I was driving in a snowstorm and I kept driving and got lost. And then the people in Minnesota took me in and it's been my home ever since. Before I get started, I want to thank all the people in the room and outside of it who have propelled the cause and got us to this cusp. And now finally, comprehensive addiction reform is within grasp. And thank you all. I don't count myself in that number because I am six and a half years out of residency, but I am happy and honored to share in the championing of this cause. Um, feel free to throw up my slide at any time and I'll get to it. One of the reasons that we're here though, let's face it, is because of the prescription drug crisis, which then bore the heroin crisis that we're still facing today. And the numbers are staggering, the deaths are heartbreaking, but there are other facts. There have been disenfranchised communities that have been struggling with heroin use for decades and they didn't get the attention from our country until the numbers got bigger. And there's something more. We didn't start paying attention as a country to these people until the kids who were passing away started to more closely resemble my kids and your kids and our kids. And that's a tragic fact, but we can move on from that and it is not too late. So we must act swiftly and decisively to honor the lives of people who could not get the help they deserved. And we need to move swiftly because these problems are now in our homes, in our living rooms, on our streets, in our neighborhoods. At Hazelden, we've had a 300% increase in the number of young people coming in for opioid addiction just in the, five, in the past five or six years. At any one time now, you'll see 40 to 50% of the clientele addicted to heroin and all the other collateral damage teen pregnancies, neonatal uh, intensive care units for babies who are born, hepatitis C, sex trafficking, and I can go on and on. We have been humble, and rightfully so, and it was an easy decision to make in changing our treatment philosophy. It's well said that sometimes the only criteria for going to, say, an AA meeting is a desire to be sober, but we had to evolve that philosophy. We had to look people in the eye to say, we will meet you where you are. You don't have to have a desire to be sober, but if you're willing to have a conversation, we will meet you and we will win you over with our compassion and our values and our commitment to your life. In order to do this, we had to do a number of things. We found that shockingly, young people who had opiate addiction had to choose between clinics that gave them medications and no therapy or therapeutic communities that gave them the therapy they needed and no medications. And we vowed to give them both because they deserve both. They deserve the best of all worlds. That meant that we used medications that were life-saving and kept young people engaged, and we have the results to prove that it's working. But it also meant that we had to adopt evidence-based modalities like motivational interviewing, which believes in the humanism and potential of these individuals to pursue their values if they see things on a level playing field. And we have done that, and we currently train our people. But there's more that needs to be done. It is true that when you say evidence-based practice, we're all assuming that it is more effective than it actually is, but the results really aren't as good as we want. The solution, though, isn't just coming up with a new medication or a new different therapy manual. The solution is making a different kind of investment. So what my one treatment recommendation is one of orientation and perspective, because that is the most important. And that's what I'm talking about in this graph. In this graph, you see that most people get addicted between their mid-teens and early adulthood. Imagine this was a social problem of any other magnitude that affected America and was a health crisis. If you knew that this was the age group that it got affected, where would you deploy your resources? Now contrast that with what we do in addiction. So I say scientifically that addiction is a developmental disorder first. That is not to say that other people of other age groups do not get addicted or don't need help. It is simply a matter of fact. Addiction is a developmental disorder. Let's consider what this means. Our infrastructure, everything from our payment model to how we allocate resources is contingent upon tertiary care. We wait for kids to cross over a tripwire, a line in the sand, and then we divvy them up into how much they've used and what symptoms they have. And we say mild, medium, or spicy substance use disorder, and then we treat them. And then the second the parents can breathe and take a deep breath, we cut off all resources. We don't treat any other chronic illness in this manner. If you saw a teenager who was morbidly obese, you would be concerned about the metabolic issues they would have maybe decades later, but you would act imperatively now. But we don't have an infrastructure. Everything from the payment system to how we treat the kids, it's a major problem for us. That's what a developmental model means. So on the front end, we must recognize that there are risk factors and trajectories that people have, genetic, individual, environmental, and we need to address these in early intervention. That's the best kind of treatment. But risks also apply on the back end. 
sober colleges, sober schools, communities, ways to get people plugged in that people have talked about today. If you treat somebody for a heart attack and they get out of the hospital, they're not gonna exercise automatically. It doesn't mean that they're all of a sudden going to take care of themselves. So risks stay with people even after they are temporarily sober, and that's the dilemma we have. So on the front end, there's an issue, and on the back end, there's an issue. You might be shocked by this, but we have a lot of data on risk factors. My colleagues at the University of Pittsburgh have developed a tool called the Transmission Liability Index. And this tool, while not perfect, and they're tinkering with it, can predict, starting at the age of 10, which kids are at high risk, risk for addiction at the age of 10 by asking less than 50 questions, usually no more than 15. And guess what? None of the questions are about drugs. We have that ability, we have that science to intervene in a different way now. The back end is also important, and I'll conclude with this. If we look at deinstitutionalization as a model, and the reason I love the Comprehensive Addiction and Recovery Act is, is because of this, because of that holistic lifespan approach. If we look at deinstitutionalization as a failed model, good intent, good promise, but front-loaded, myopic, short-sighted, and there wasn't enough on the back end, and people with mental health issues still suffer, families still suffer because there isn't that support, well, CARA is doing things differently and we need to invest in that. Fundamentally, drugs that kids get addicted to will change over time, and the policies we make around it will also change, and those are important discussions to have. But what I am telling you is that addiction, from a developmental perspective, is not about drugs. Addiction is about people. Addiction is about families. Addiction is about communities. And if we work hard together, we can make addiction about redemption. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lee. And now, uh, A.J. Sinercio, who's Vice President of Young People in Recovery. Come on up. <laughs> 